Let's uh, last time check uh, if you are in the right room. Yes. Uh, let's talk about Kafka, Kafka Connect, and uh, distributed, hopefully, <laughs> caches and stuff. Anyone for uh, Kafka Connect? Kafka? Anyone? All right. Okay. Good you, morning. Are, how many of you are working with Kafka or current implementation? Okay. A few, few events. Okay. Interesting. Okay. So we'll try to um, give you some of the ideas how Kafka can be used to get with distributed caches. And uh, let's, let's talk about it. So since you're already here, um, we're not going to spend some time to explain who we are, because you probably read this. Otherwise, if you didn't read, yeah, if you didn't read this, it really doesn't matter. Yeah, what matters here is Twitter. How many of you folks have a Twitter here? Just one person. All right, so the Twitter is a very interesting social network. So um, you probably want to use it in 2019 because, um, okay, we'll give you an example. President of the United States uses Twitter a lot, and you can learn some of the news from the Twitter. We also use Twitter a lot, but not the way how the President of the United States uses it, right? Something like that. All right, so information. Information or data um, always, always important. So, in these days, it's more important when the information is, is facts. So yeah, it's cool that you have a Hadoop cluster, you can go and scrap some of the logs from the past, you can figure out some of the information. But these days, you want to have information now. Information now. So this is most important that you're getting this information fast. You're getting this request from Alexa, what time is in London? In London, it's 12 p.m. You don't want to get this information outdated. You don't want to get this result very, you know, wait for this result for a very long time because the time is, is very relevant here. What is also relevant, Ricardo? Uh, what's also relevant is about the data being sent. Sorry, I don't know that. <laughs> it's not your turn, right? <laughs> you're, you're coming later. Actually, we forgot to introduce her because we are three presenters today. So, Ricardo, uh, Victor, and Diego got the much for that. So back to the presentation, uh, Victor said that data needs to be, of course, uh, ready to access, right? It needs to be, have some speedness. But more importantly these days is the ability for systems and applications to provide context for data. So what context would mean for you? Context would mean that the data needs to be, first, relevant, right? It needs to be accurate, right? It cannot be some outdated data that you, your transaction system, your decision basis system will take decisions on, on, on it, right? So we are actually bringing this presentation to you to talk about these two subjects, right? Uh, of course, to solve the first problem, we're going to use caches, right? Or memory data grades or whatever type of caches we, are, uh, we have available today. But the Kafka part, right? That's where we are bringing together Kafka with the caches because Kafka will solve the problem of being contextual, right? So that's what this presentation is all about. Uh, so just to give you a concrete yeah, example, actually I'm not going to keep this example because Victor is going to keep it. Yeah. So it's it's cool when you have the sum of the data. I will already give you idea about like a real time data and the data that important is given more enough time. But also important is the latency. How fast data will arrive to the system that will be responsible to make a decision. So how <laughs> important would be information that from the sensors of your car that there was a collision? Uh, after 30 minutes of collision, right? Maybe not very relevant. And uh, in this case, your airbag will not be not be useful at the, at any, anymore. Um, so uh, the information from sensors that we'll be using to uh, to make a decision when we need to apply all these chemicals to implode this uh, the airbag is also also uh, important. What also is important is uh, not only that we get information in time, but we also get information um, relevant. Relevant, right? like that the contextual part I was explaining before. Like this is, for example, is an incident that occurred in Boston, Massachusetts, about an uh, old lady that she was trying to outrun a rail train, and she did try that because she heard on the news, right, the car news, that there will be no rail train that day. And guess what? The information was outdated. So that is what happened. So this is a metaphor about what systems can also suffer when you're dealing with outdated data. So being contextual is very important. Okay, so to get so how what can help us to achieve this uh, the freshness of data and readiness of the data and get this data with very low latency. 
Um, it's in, in memory summit, right? But let's talk about some of the in memory, in memory the things related to in memory, right? Uh, cache. Or we can talk about storage and I.O. What do you think? No, right? It's memory summit, I think it's buried in memory, right? Okay, good. All right, so the cache, that thing that keep, can keep your data uh, fastly accessible, so you can get this data very fast. And um, the access to this data also requires, to, it needs to be like very easy. So you don't need to write like a sophisticated query to access the data, usually it's a parallel key value pad. Uh, and uh, for application developers, people who write the apps, who write this application, who use this data, the access in the cache is, is very simple and very easy. So applications much easier will talk, talk to cache and after that some other infrastructure will be responsible for invalidating the cache. Speaking about cache invalidation, as you know, it's one of the hardest problems in computer science, right? Hopefully. The, we'll... the second one, right? Because the first one is naming variables. Right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, because the data is close to your code, data is close to your application, the latency to access this data, to use this to make some decisions, is minimum, right? So it's in memory, so we use less uh, cycles of like returning data from disk uh, because data is already somewhere somewhere close to your application. Um, and uh, someone or something needs to keep this updated. Remember the case where data was available for uh, for uh, for old lady, uh, but data was outdated. So cache of her browser probably was not. Uh, updated, so that's why you get the irrelevant news. And uh, the the simplification or the way how to access this data in a simple way without like learning some additional languages, uh, like uh, uh, query languages, uh, because of different structure of uh, storage that particular cache is implying, it's also important. So let's talk a little <coughs> bit about the different type of caches that we have these days. I mean, there are two most common ones. The first one is that what we call the built-in caches, which every programming language kind of has supported. Some programming language might call it this special data structures, but in the end of the day, is a way for developers to load all the data that is being produced or consumed by the application into memory, right? So that works fine, but that has one problem. Who here knows what the problem is? Crush. It may crush the application, right, but why? You're right, but there's a more... It's volatile, you, you lose the data. It loses the data, but also, would you agree that because we are dealing today with large amounts of data, if you try to bring all this data into application memory space, what's going to happen with the application? Right? Because we don't have large amount of memory in your application. So what is the solution for this? It's the second type of cache, which is in-memory data or in-memory data fabrics, or in-memory data caches, whatever the industry is calling these days, right? So the way in-memory data grids, or caches, or fabrics, whatever you want, you want to call it, works, we have this large amount of caches that are distributed in a network, right? So in that way, you get the data and partition or replicate it across all those nodes. So in that way, you can scale out your architecture. Your, you can keep up your volume of data without necessarily crashing your application. Right? So there's a lot of in-memory data grids out there that does this very well. Right? We're not going to talk in this presentation about one specifically, but pretty much all of them does this uh, pretty, much, pretty well. Right? So what you have to actually worry about when you were working with this type of data grid is this point right here. Right? This is the most important one. The other ones, of course, are important, just like I said before. But choose one in-memory data grid that will allow you, as a developer, as architects, to retrieve the data in a constant time, right? Regardless of the size of your cache, obviously. Regardless of the size of the you don't cache. Wanna, you want to spend more time. You don't want to spend more time to retrieving this data uh, yeah. just because you have more data. So you want to have a constant time to retrieve this. Another thing is that um, it's, it's a polyglot thing, right? Yeah. So ability to have the um, access to this maybe cache data in distributed fashion from multiple, multiple applications. Uh, that written potentially in the different languages. Uh, it's, also, it's also important because it's already distributed, it's already over network somewhere. So it would be wasteful uh, not to leverage this kind of functionality. All right, so this is kind of like a background, basic things, one-on-one, caching one-on-one, and uh, how about doing something fun? Yep. 
All right. So um, there is a there was a, like very popular show in my childhood. I'm originally from Russia. Any Russian people who can relate to this? Okay. Do people know this this joke this this show? But this show actually was knockoff from the American TV show. It's called The Name the Tune. And uh, today we're going to be playing Name the Tune. So we're going to be you're going to be participating. Um, and uh, we're going to be using all these cool technologies to name the tune. As Ricardo likes to say, a few words about streaming. Yep. It's a streaming of audio. Streaming Music of streaming, voice streaming, and data streaming. It's a lot of streaming and one single demo. You can enjoy it, probably. All right? Yeah. So, what's the idea? All right. So, we're going to get back, back to this real, real quick. But the first thing I would like to show you is... Too fast? Too fast for her too. Too fast. So the first one I would like to introduce is that in this architecture that we brought to you, there are two transactions. The first one is this one where Victor and I we're going to interact with the Echo Dot device from Amazon, right? I'm not going to say her name because it will wake it up right, right quickly. And when I do this, it's going to execute a Lambda function on AWS, which in turn is going to query a Redis. So let me give you a glimpse about how that works. Alexa. Tell me who is the winner. And it goes to space, in time, in cloud, and calculates stuff, and the, the Wi-Fi in the conference rooms is always reliable. So that's why this, uh, you know, relevant uh, questions about latency and things about the getting contextual data in conference, Wi-Fi in conference demo, it's super, super, super relevant. Ricardo, you need to do something because I'm losing words. Yeah, words, words continue. Well, actually, you know what? There are no winners no. at this time. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So uh, the guy was, was switching. To the, all right. Uh, <laughs> cache uh, and validation and... Uh, in action. So there's no winners, meaning that the cache is cold right exactly. now, so there's no data. So what's going to happen is that we're going to give you some ways for interact with the application, so that's why we're going to scan with your phone the barcode, and you're going to get to produce records, but not only produce records as is, you're going to try to guess what song we are playing on the Echo Dot. Right, so your guess Over is going here, to be transformed. We're going to be using this engine called KSQL, which is streaming SQL engine for Apache Kafka that allows us to perform all sorts of uh, uh, computations, and we will be we will be using it to uh, to try to match your request with the what is actually currently playing. Can we see what's actually currently playing? How it looks like? Sure. Let me show you how that works. Remember, we're going to combine voice streaming with music streaming. So what I'm doing here is selecting on top of the fabric of Kafka, which is topics, right? So for now, just think about songs as a plain Kafka topic, right? So what's going to happen is that whatever song I use my Spotify account is going to be streaming out into the Kafka stream. Can I, can I, can I try? Sure, pick a song. Alexa, shuffle songs by Elton John. Shuffling songs by Elton John from Ricardo's Spotify. Okay, so it's a Ricardo Spotify, so I'm not, I don't know what kind of songs. That's a perfect. It was shuffled, it was unprepared, and it was Rocket Man. It was Rocket Man. Okay. Not so, any propaganda for the movie, right? This is. So, Alexa, next one, just to test if it's working fine. Spotify, voice streaming, coffee streaming. Got the logic, right? Go ahead. All right. So we can listen awesome uh, tunes, but um, let's get some interactivity here. Yeah, that's okay. Can we bring that QR code on the on the screen? Sure. So if you may, please use your phones and scan this barcode. Just open up your camera. If you have an iPhone. Oh, how it works? I don't know. I have no idea. <laughs> so. All right. So when you scan this barcode, it's going to suggest to open an application, and by using that application, you can actually put your guess and please type your name because we can know who is going to be the winner after, after all. Uh, please, when you type your name, be polite when you do this because we've run this demo before and some people kind of put some uh, inappropriate names right there that would show up here. So uh, just to be in compliance with the uh, conference code. So, Alexa, play next. Alright, so 
not yet, not yet. One second, pause. So what I'm gonna do here now, guys, is of course we're not going to show you the song name because it will be too obvious, right? So I'm gonna stop this query, and what I'm going to show you is simply the author or the band who does the song, and that's how you are gonna try to guess, right? So your guesses are going to show up here in this topic called guesses, right? And whatever the winner is, winners with S, Ricardo, is gonna show up here. So shall we? Do it. All right, let me put an easy one. Like, all right. That's a new one. So, in the screen, if you were lucky to open the screen, you can type the name of the song. It's it's easy one, you know, and the name, and see. The word is lowercase or uppercase. Just type the name. Just the name of the song. You don't need to put the full name of the band because we already have this. All right. Alexa. And we have a winner. Alexa, tell me who's the winner. The winner is Joe Dot G. Oh, congratulations! Where is the Joe Dot G? All right, congratulations. Uh, so, what happens here, Ricardo? Let's go back here to the presentation mode, and then let's explain again. Now the architecture is going to make more sense. So, what's happening here, guys, is that we are doing a combination of too fast. Do not type too fast. Yeah. Yep. We're doing a combination of stream processing and cache updates. So your guesses, which you, this is you, by the way, right? So you input your guesses and that guesses went started into a Kafka talk, right? Plain O producer, there's no nothing fun thing here. But what happened after this is that we started this whole KSQL processing. KSQL is an abstraction on top of a framework called Kafka Streams. And based on your guess, we correlate it with the information that was already on the song topic. So we are literally translated to SQL words. We try to do a join, right? Plain O join SQL. If that join matches, it will produce an output, right? And that output was started into this another Kafka topic, let's call output topic. And here where the magic, where you, the remaining of the presentation is gonna talk about. We have this Kafka Connect framework that is continuously pulling data from that topic and updating our cache, right? So in other words, we are pushing data into the cache instead of letting your application to load the data and proactively, reactively updating the cache. So we are inverting the roles right here. Another microservice that we have here, it's another uh, data stream that goes over here. So when we're requesting this data, it's essentially uh, the voice, uh, they call it speechlet in, uh, in Amazon terms, basically speechlet runs as a, as a Lambda function inside uh, AWS Lambda. And uh, what it does, it just does one simple thing. And so in Java, it has an API to, to connect to this uh, Redis cluster. It just get the key value pair, that's it. So in this case, the something external will be responsible to keep your cache updated. So, or like you want to go like a hot or like a updated or contextual or a consistent cache or something like that, right? So in this case, these two flows, they don't really know about each other, right? So it can be that you might have a different application that will be re, um, reading data from this cache. For example, you're also displaying this data in, uh, in, the, in the web, so this web application will query Redis and display it on the web. Or you might have another thing that uh, will be throwing some of the notification on the mobile app. And in this case, it can um, get this information out of uh, Kafka topic if there's another connector. So now we, it's time, like we've seen this slide a few times, so you're probably eager about talk about the cache, caching pattern. So essentially what we, uh, what we see here is the pattern called like I said, like a hot cache or like constantly updated cache, something like that, right? So, um, or like Ricardo called this uh, refresh ahead, right? So in this case, the something uh, can can be can refresh uh, your cache ahead of time. It can be timer or it can be some events. In this particular case, we use a Kafka streaming platform that will be responsible to do these updates, right? Um, and uh, uh, 
Just, just one. Uh, yeah. uh, one popular design that people and most developers and architects kind of use with cache and basic technology is what we call cache aside. Right. So what's cache aside is when your application tries to read from the cache and when it doesn't find the answers there, it goes to a database or a persistent store somewhere and then gets the data and then reactively updates the cache. So in this case right here, like Victor is explaining, we are proactively updating the cache continuously with data coming from not necessarily databases, but sources, right? Whatever the source is. It could be maybe CDR for the mainframe, right? Because we have a Kafka connected for it. So that's one of the design choices that you could have. So for the application perspective, the data is always fresh, right? So it's quicker. So um, in the previous slide, when we were explaining you how the, the Redis cache is updating, uh, we use this concept of, uh, there's actually uh, one connector that called the Kafka Connect Scene Connector, meaning that it will be constantly reading Kafka topic. And when this new event happens on Kafka topic, it will automatically, will, uh, you know, sync it to underlying, uh, underlying target. In this particular case, it's Redis. And the beauty of the technology of Kafka Connect, it unifies the way how you can do for now. For the same data, for the same topic, you can have uh, multiple different connectors. You can syn uh, synchronously or uh, synchronize multiple sources, um, not only Redis. In this particular case, on this picture, we have this uh, example of uh, source connector. So in this case, there's a connector that constantly either polling or depends on the mechanism that's available in particular data source. Uh, it's constantly polling and getting this data uh, from the source and constantly pushing this stuff. If something happens on database, like there's a, there is a, a change on database, uh, it can be either JBC connector that will be pulling some of the table that running some select, or it can be CDC connector. As Ricardo will give example where you have a, a the, the mainframe DB2, where you have a the CDC connector that can listen transaction log from DB2. And one million dollar question, but why do you do this? Because it's costly to go to the mainframe to retrieve the data, right? So that's one of the architectural reasons why you choose this. Okay, so there is another pattern. So, so once you're doing this, you have already this uh, mediator, this intermediate uh, system that allows you to do, why don't you do something with this data? Sometimes you need to play by the rules with the government and you be compliant with some regulations. Some of the systems need to be separated. Some of the data can go to one system, cannot go to another system. So you can need to do some of the data cleansing, some of the, uh, some of the filtering, some of the uh, updating, or you just simply want to have um, like some of the routing logic would send your application. So obviously uh, you, need, you need to you know, get your um, slaves rolling and after that write the consumer producer or maybe Kafka Connect or Kafka Streams if you're more, more advanced uh, Kafka user or you probably already know uh, SQL. Key SQL is, uh, um, has a, some, some set that you already know of symbol but this is a SQL for, <coughs> for uh, streaming data. It's a SQL. Yeah. So for uh, those of you who use databases or uh, like modern version of databases, uh, can you switch, sure. back? Yeah, switch back for a second? So think what we see here right now, this, this select, this guy, this particular thing, um, it is a thing that's called uh, continuous query, right? So the query will be running uh, and will be displaying the data arise to the system. So it doesn't continuously query Kafka. It sits there and waits for new message. If new message arrive and this message are, uh, um, is uh, appear in this winner's topic, so we will or uh, stream, so we will be able to um, get this result. So if you want to explain this stream right here, which is the stream that does actually the magic of matching the song. Yeah. So the uh, so what Ricardo did, he just run this comment that allows us to see what actually this stream look like. So in this particular case, we have a stream that uh, represents a select from another stream. So we waiting for the messages for a particular topic uh, and we also persisting this. So this is the difference between these two, between this select, which is continuous query and it runs until the session is over. Now you want to have a persistent query that constantly runs this and they constantly performs some of the logic for you. So in this case, we need to make it persistent. We do create a uh, great stream as select. So this is what, what we have over here. Yep, this, yep. this guy. And most importantly, we also have the ability to do windowing, which means that we can do this accumulation of results like a buffer within a window of time, like five minutes, one minute. That's one of the use cases like a running average, use cases like count, use cases like a summing, 
within certain windows. So you're interested about certain trades that were sold, uh, that, that would happen within five win window, so you can analyze some of trend. I don't know, I'm super, uh, <laughs> super proficient in the, in the financial analysis. So it's how you analyze trend probably. You just like have a five minute window and after that you're counting how many how many uh, socks someone bought or, or sell? So you can do this you're with just one that's single quick. talk later about this, right? Yeah, yeah. So there will be talk like uh, where I will talking about the, some of the key SQL aspects as well. Sure. All right. So this is where we're using the cash uh, uh, cash ahead and adapt um, the the data that comes into into play. Uh, Kafka Connect actually ships with some of the things called the simple message transformer that allows to perform more or less simple transformation, right? So you need to change the data from database format into different uh, the data format or like date format, or you want to mask some of the uh, some of the data, social security or some other um, sensitive data you want to, you can do this. But if you need to do more complex things like routing, filtering, or like uh, do some, some, some computation, you can use KC tool for that. All right. So this is another pattern that we often kind of like can use as well if you are already leveraging Kafka Connect. We call this right behind, uh, mostly because that's a common term found in many memory data grid technologies out there. So as you can see here, this is the contrary of what we've been done before. So now we're actually pulling the data from the application cache into, and Kafka Connect is doing the job of writing back into the database. So for obvious reasons, why would we do this? Because maybe there are some other applications or other caches that needs to be populated as well with the same information. Remember, data needs to be accurate, contextual, and relevant, right? So you can also broadcast that data from multiple databases using Kafka. So uh, one of the things that people kind of ask us when we do this presentation is, okay, but why? what are the advantages of using Kafka and Kafka Connect for doing the same thing that maybe your in-memory data grid would do? Or maybe you can actually sit down and write the code for it. And the reason for this are two. The first one is because Kafka is a persistent and reliable technology. So you get reliability and consistency out of the box. You don't have to write the code for this, right? Kafka Connect alleviates the problem of writing code for doing this integration part. So we have, I don't know how many, plus 80 connectors for whatever databases, caches, Redis, or technologies out there, even mainframe databases. So in that, in that way, you can actually resolve the part of connectivity and replication of data without actually writing a single line of code. That's the beauty of Kafka Connect. It alleviates the pressure of writing code into a project, right? Yeah. And, and with the with the connectors and the custom code is always uh, kind of uh, balanced between like a build versus buy. In this case, buy just like use open source connect and who's going to be supporting this. Like if you're comfortable with writing code and you're supporting this versus component model, which just use a component and rely on either vendor or rely on the community to support this connector for you. In a, a variation of this pattern, just like the refresh ahead one, we also have the adaptation part. So. That is kind of a, a simpler to understand because uh, when we are dealing with this guy over here, often we have to rely on the concept of schemas, right? So it's not just go there and write the data as it was. You have to comply with an existing schema in order to be consistent, right? So the point here is that maybe the information on the cache is not in the appropriate format that goes to ready for go to the database. So you do the transformation part to make sure that the format will be compatible with the database or whatever destination you are trying to write, trying to write the record to, right? And one kind of a best practice that we recommended for this is using schema hashes to for connect models. Like, for example, imagine that you have an enterprise company that has this MDM, master data management platform, and you have to rely on the master data format that has been established for the organization. So you can actually define that schema put on schema hash history, and Kafka Connect has the ability for automatically fetch the schemas before doing the serialization to the database, fetch the schemas from there. So that, again, is code that you don't have to write. So that means agility and development. And another important uh, point here is that KSQL actually can work with, uh, with uh, structured format like JSON uh, and, uh, and CSV, not structured. It's a very enterprising format, but it's not structured. Um, and the uh, Avro format. So uh, for the Avro, it relies on schema registry to work with this and to store the schema there, to read the schema there. So it is uh, quite powerful when you don't need to kind of like program this, uh, uh, like all the serializer, deserializer, but simply rely on the thing that comes out of the box. 
And only difference between like dealing with JSON versus dealing with Avro in the case SQL would be just to change the format how the data would be encoded. All right. Now, with the um, with the great power comes great responsibility. So let's let's think about this when we can get this beyond the point where we have our local cache and uh, make this to the point where we have a global cache. Right. This is a use case that. Um, also known as a event uh, uh, federation, where you have multiple data centers, you have these applications between uh, different data centers. You don't want to definitely spend your cache or your Kafka cluster or something like that across the multiple uh, geographical distributed locations. At least for now. At least for now, we're, we're working. We're working on something to get this like a global Kafka into life. But for now, we have to rely on the concept of uh, the replicator, which is uh, which is a tool that uh, mediates and responsible for running uh, the moving data around in multiple uh, data data uh, data centers. And the cool thing is that it's a replicator. Not, it's, it's not just about just a parenthesis, Victor. Yeah. Not just about uh, making sure you are replicated across the geographies, right? Like for example. Have you, have you seen that GCP, Google Cloud, was kind of unavailable for more than six hours yesterday? So imagine that your whole application is relied on a single region. You do want to replicate that data for a backup for recoverability. Since so you brought you the sure. Google Cloud, your application might not depend on a single vendor provider. So in this case, you might have deployment in cloud between different vendor providers, like Gotham Cloud does. Yep. Um, and uh, it's it's a variation of this one. And the cool thing about this replicator, replicator also is built on top of Kafka Connect framework. So Kafka Connect framework not only provides the uh, it's it's not only provides you a set of connectors, but also provides you runtime that will be responsible for restarting your task if something you fail to scaling up and uh, scaling out and scale and scale down this kind of thing. So um, and all these nice features and uh, dealing with uh, security and have this uh, traffic encrypted with SSL. It's also and apply ACLs. It's also handled by uh, by by Connect framework and transparently available for all connectors. So you're dealing with connector that. Uh, don't know anything about security. It's good because it's not supposed to because it runs on top of runtime and the runtime will be responsible for providing this security capabilities. All right. So now we're kind of heading for the end of the presentation. So, but although we still have time, we are doing good for time management. Yeah. Right? So yeah. we're, we're getting better. Yeah. Right, so let's talk about the connect implementation strategies. Right? Uh, as we mentioned before. That the whole purpose of this presentation it is using Kafka Connect and Kafka to proactively update your cache or getting the data from your cache to prag. In this case, will be reactively, the appropriate bit word, but reactively flush data back to a database, right? So there are some very pretty cool memory data grids out there, and the good part is that most of them already have Kafka connectors available. Hey. So what that means for you again is this is code. You don't have to write, right? And why we are emphasizing this so much? We uh, we work at Confluent, right? Which is uh, the company that one of the companies that produces the technology company in the open source world. And as a company that provides consultancy and support for people dealing with Apache Kafka, what we have seen is kind of an anti-pattern that we have seen a lot is people spending lots of cycles writing code for accomplishing things that are already available out of the box. Right? For example, there are projects that need to do the whole magic over here and developers and offshore companies are kind of uh, spending three or four months only doing the integration part. And when we see this, they say, why are you using Kafka Connect? So that's, that's, that, that's the awareness we're trying to bring for you with this presentation, right? So again, because we have out-of-the-box connectors, Redis, Metcache, Grid Game, Finispan, all of them are kind of uh, out of the box. Ricardo, so sure. you're talking about these connectors things, right? Yeah. Can you actually show where people can go and find these connectors? Uh, yeah. Confluent.io yeah. slash hub, this is the place where we go. And uh, okay. whenever you in doubt in terms of, okay, sh should I write this? Confluent.io. Confluent.io slash hub. Slash hub. Hub, yep. And uh, when you in doubt, you always go to this location and type something, I don't know, like, DB2. 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 Well, um, have it. And uh, there's a few different connectors. Some of the connectors, they are, uh, for example, supported by us. I mean that we develop this and we provide support this. And uh, the, some of the connectors might have uh, the vendor implementation. Some of the vendors implemented. Can, you, uh, can we go back real quick? For the flight? Or yeah, just, just, just back. Yeah. Okay. 
No, no, to uh, to the previous page. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. So there's uh, some some uh, Sorry, some uh, vendor that provides the another connector. If we do things, I don't know, like do uh, Oracle. Just let's see what kind of stuff we have for Oracle. And uh, again, there's Oracle Golden Gate connector that can uh, be integrated for Golden Gate and listens the change uh, uh, change events from the Oracle database. And after that, stream these changes into Kafka. Uh, there's also uh, SQ data CDC connector that allows to you know listen this one. And the different uh, there are different like tags as you can see. There's verified standard. There's verified. Well, they try to do a grid game. Um, grid game. Yeah, grid game. Or ignite. Yeah. Your your Russian accent is really. Yeah. So for example, this connector is certified verified gold, meaning that they, we went through the cycles with the vendor, we validate ourselves, uh, and there's some uh, some production customers who use this these days with this connector with the Kafka integration. I will be talking about this particular use case uh, today afternoon with Dennis from uh, from Grid Game, so we'll get back on this one. So let's yeah, let's switch the slides. So this is the standard way. But what if what if there's something that you can find, right? Yeah. But there's also um, different a different type of integration that also we support in Confluent Hub. So uh, the connect the connectors is one of the things that uh, it's kind of when the people usually start. But we also support hosting their simple message transformers and some different type of integration that based maybe on the consumer producer API. So for example, like uh, Hazelcast uh, has this like Hazelcast Jet framework that um, uh, has integration with Kafka that uses underlying uh, the consumer and producer to read data from Kafka and, and write data from Kafka. Hazelcast Jet is the stream processing framework. Uh, maybe it doesn't need um, uh, the connector per se, uh, so that's why it can do this through Hazelcast Jet. Um, so the like a gem file, uh, also known as a Apache Geo, that has integration uh, to, to through uh, Spring, um, Spring Spring data, data integration um, for, for 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 integrating with Kafka. And Spring also in general has a good integration with Kafka. There is a Spring Kafka library. There is Spring Cloud Streams um, that works well with overall infrastructure that we're talking about. And and, and if you if you deal with some uh, in memory data grader cache technology that doesn't have a connector out of the box. Uh, guess what? You can also build one using the Connect API. So Kafka Connect provides an SDK for it. So you can always build one, right? Of course, you, that's the type of thing that you would, would need to do once and reuse multiple times. But if you are dealing with something that not necessarily is so known or and for this particular use case, we're also going to be talking today afternoon uh, how like how to write a custom connector for some system that provides the streaming data, but uh, you know there's no connector available. So how you can write your own? All right, so um, one, uh, one less awesome thing that also is, is, uh, is great out there. Uh, this is a project called uh, Debezium. Uh, the project is, is open source, it's sponsored by Red Hat, lots of engineers from Red Hat working on this one. So Debezium is, is the goal to bring like the open source to change that the capture into the world. So they have a connectors to uh, MySQL being logged, to Postgres being logged. They also try to implement open source uh, reader for uh, Oracle Xtreme and Oracle LogMiner, this technology that uh, like uh, uh, allow to get access to underlying transaction logs. So they need to you don't need to rob the bank or like uh, take hostages to buy Golden Gate since you're using this uh, uh, Oracle thing, right? And what, one of the interesting things about this uh, the Bezium project is that uh, there is a fundamental difference between what we call CDC chain data capture, right, and pulling the database records, right. Most of the Kafka connectors we, we've shown before, they have the strategy of do poly, right? Which means every five seconds, go to the database, run a select statement, and then pull the records that are a result of the select, right? That works, of course it works. But it's not necessarily CDC. CDC is when you are in the log level of the database. You are actually capturing all the changes, inserts, deletes, updates, right? Even some DDL statements, and you are retrieving all those events as a stream, and you can stream that back into Kafka, right? So that's one of the most important strategies that Divisa brings to you. And the cool thing about all these things, again, I want to repeat this because it's very important. Once the thing inside the Kafka, you can do easy fan out. You don't need to, uh, you know, Kafka becomes a source of truth. You can fan out to different systems. Different systems can do whatever they want. They can replay it if they, like, fail to process on the first time. Kafka allows you not only uh, read the messages in the pop up fashion, but also you can replay it. You can reset your set from beginning of time, so or uh, as as long as your data available. So 
once you get data out of your database, um, this is one of the things that uh, uh, the major customers, uh, I guess it's the Royal Bank of Canada, they offload the data from the mainframe and they make the data of payments. They, they were running some of the process, payment processing inside mainframes, allow the payments data available for multiple systems. Before that, you know, in the big enterprises, what they did, they waited, well, the other systems, they waited months to get the file from mainframe and all the file contains data from the last uh, last month. Guess what? At some point, this data may be not relevant anymore uh, for, for the use cases that they're trying to get. Right. All right, uh, and uh, uh, the thing that I like about the, the, the so we at the Confluent, we're trying to make uh, available Kafka connectors, everything to run everywhere. So regardless of your deployment platform, deployment strategy, we are trying to get you covered. We, we're providing packages for, for major Linux distribution, Debian, uh, Red Hat, uh, the Docker containers. There's no, there's no like open source or like whatever standard images of Apache Kafka. Probably if you're using uh, the Docker images, you're probably using either ours and there's some of the you know handmade, um, but ours images, it's better. <laughs> um, uh, no, obviously, the cloud these days is, is important, so we, we also happen to run the best in class uh, Kafka, uh, managed Kafka thing in the, in, in the cloud. And uh, the recently, we just announced this kind of very cool feature where you don't really need to think about your um, like how many nodes you provision, like what's your what ingress ingress, because you know we can charge you only for the things that you use. If you're using a little, we will just charge you a little. If you're using a lot of things, we will probably will talk about your use case and provide you better better rates to do this. And obviously, uh, run this in Kubernetes if you're interested to run this like a private uh, uh, platform as a service inside your organization or maybe in the public cloud, right? Uh, if you want to learn more, uh, we have an awesome blog where we're writing lots of technical stuff, business stuff, and a lot of interesting things. For those of you who have uh, some specific questions, specific um, questions that you can ask engineers, we're running community Slack um, where people can go and ask questions with actual people who are working on this one. Not only people who work at Confluent, but in general community. Um, and plus, if you want to meet with people around the world who talk about Kafka Connect, uh, Kafka Stream, Stream Processing, KSQL, and other things, we have a set of meetups where you can go and find information. Again, uh, this was awesome regarding Vieri. You're from everywhere, but that's okay. Blah, 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 blah. I'm from blah, Brazil. Blah, 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 blah. <laughs> um, and uh, my name is Victor Gamma. And uh, again, uh, some of the Kafka, uh, the Confluent community, and there's two chat rooms where we can talk about connectors. Yeah. Praise us on Twitter. If you will be asked about this session, you need to give a thumbs up, five stars, and like extra tips. And yeah. uh, we available for advanced interrogation. Uh, and thank you for your time. Can I ask you just a quick favor? Can we do a selfie with you guys? You, do you have the permission for it? Can you do it, yeah. Victor? You have a strong arm. Yeah, you need to you need to ask because you're in Europe, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. GPDA. GDPR. Right. Okay. So was in Kafka. Hey. Okay. Hey, you cut me off, man. Yeah, that's okay. <laughs> that's okay. All right. All right. Thanks, guys. Um, any questions? Yeah. I think we have. Go yeah. Ahead. yeah. One recent criticism about CDC is that it has a great encapsulation. And people you see in the industry on the, you know, anything you can do is in the You spew out your label, essentially. True. What are the best plans when adopting CDC? Well, I think the first one is actually deciding what type of data you want to bring into Kafka, right? Uh, Kafka is all about, if you think about the Kafka logo, which is the multiple points, is uh, write once and read everywhere, right? So what type of data you want to bring? You, guess you don't want to select all your tables from your database, right, or schemas. So and actually also, what's going to be the volume of data you're going to read into the database and not put some pressure on your database? Kafka can handle uh, scalability very well. I mean, that's not the point. It's more like a, what's kind of pressure you're going to put in your source database because it might still be one transactional database where applications are connecting and relying to it. Right? Yeah, besides that, 
it's pretty much deciding what type you want and uh, what's going to be the frequency of the log you're going to read it, that kind of stuff. To this point uh, that you mentioned, um, it's really about where you want to reconstruct this model. If you have ability to, for example, CDC can query views, right? So yeah. there's no there's no API that allows you to query views. It has a transaction log that can have uh, only materialized structures. So if um, you see that your data model would be relevant for multiple other places, so they don't need to reconstruct this so this case, you can you know stream this like a view, and after that you apply a schema, and after that everyone will read the schema and will get this data. So in this case, probably you shouldn't use CDC. In some cases, it's only choice because um, in some cases it won't allow you to run certain queries because this uh, license uh, something some kerfuffle with the, some some enterprise databases um, that will require some um, you know number of licenses or number of connections and things like that. Um, another thing is how complex your data structure. You're absolutely right when you say that uh, people tend to just you know bring everything and after that okay let's figure out. So KSQL allows you kind of reconstruct this on another side if you want to do that. So KSQL can read multiple you know you can you can do multi stages like joins and the materialize different uh, uh, different uh, tables and uh, different uh, streams into different uh, different Kafka topics after that. So it really depends how you're comfortable with um, before or after when you wanted to construct your data model. Yep. Any more questions? Yeah, if you see us around here, uh, you can yeah. Let's let's do one, one last one. Um, yeah. You're talking about distributing data to. There's a, what about the other way around, which is the, the, those caches themselves are distributed now. Mm -hmm. and you can have, so you feed one in. How do you draw the line between the cache before uh, to data versus put into caches? Kafka is always is the center of your, your data. Kafka is the source of truth. Again, I'm biased, obviously. Um, but in this case, you can always materialize any type of data structure in any other system. So for example, the way how some companies like New York Times, they wrote a blog uh, where they were talking how to use Kafka, and they use Kafka, there's the concept of compacted topics that they store on the latest and greatest uh, value for a particular key. So the way how they use this data is that other systems can uh, reconstruct um, their, for example, they stored in Kafka all the articles that was written from the beginning of times for New York Times. Um, they probably hack around something and have like infinity retention, so the data will not expire inside the Kafka because Kafka will support retention. So in this case, the system that is responsible for reading the data, maybe it's a cache that will be serving some of the web application, will be responsible to, to reading this and reconstructing this. Um, another use case is to have uh, this, this type of data pre reloaded in Kafka and after that your application can you need to like imagine you need to get the status of your inventory in your uh, some some store you don't really care about whole the data whole stream of the data you only care about latest and greatest amounts so you can store this kind of data in kafka and other systems who are interested in this one can receive this data uh, in their side you can ask me okay so does it bring uh, like uh, the data duplication on the multiple places? yes it, it does but uh, your system that's responsible for you know serving data it like end user will be using they don't really care if the system will go down because they always can restart this on read this from Kafka because Kafka is going to be a source of truth here yeah, you mentioned the word where we draw the line sometimes as simple as uh, what type of code the application can do like uh, the application can simply manipulate cache so instead of, because Kafka forces you to read the data as a stream of records, right? Sometimes the developers simply don't want to do this and get and pull. That's a problem. When we talk, yeah, when we talk about this uh, cache aside pattern, when you have to <coughs> write multiple places, you need to write to cache, you need to write a database. In this case, who will be who will be responsible for like this transactional integrity between these data sources? When it's data in Kafka, and Kafka will do the push, that the Kafka Connect will do the push. In this case, Kafka Connect will be responsible for keeping this offset, how the data was <coughs> in the target system and how the data was in the, in the source system. So it is just a turning database inside out plus removing the distributed transactions in, 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 into, because it's terrible. 
All right, thank you so much. Uh, again, if you see us around, just grab us, ask questions. And, uh...